Hi everyone, welcome to another On This Day in Canadian Military History live stream. Continuing the Normandy month, uh, the theme of Normandy month. Uh, today we're going back to the beginning pretty much for the land campaign. We're going to be looking at uh, Mike Red sector of Juneau Beach. Uh, excited to do this one. Uh, wanting to wanted to do more of these sector focused things. Just didn't work out with timing and all that kind of stuff. Maybe maybe next year. But uh, excited to get to look at really a portion of the beach, uh, one that most of you probably know the best, even if you don't realize it. And we'll get to reasons why that is uh, a little bit later. Uh, but uh, with that said, uh, one housekeeping note before we do start. Um, so today I have Alex uh, Fitzgerald Black from the Juno Beach Center on uh, in a capacity to talk about Mike Red Sector. Uh, he does work for the Juno Beach Center. Now, I know lots of people have lots of questions and comments and concerns regarding the, the ongoing situation involving uh, the JBC. Uh, for today, I'm, we're going to talk about uh, it. We'll answer questions or Alex will answer questions as best as he can. Uh, but I would like to ask if you do have questions, we'll save some time at the end for that. Uh, I think that'll be best because Alex has done some great work with this presentation. He's done some good digging. He's got some good photos and some good insights and some good photos of his own. So I'd like to focus on those. And then uh, once we've kind of done that, wrapped up, hit all those questions, we can uh, do those and fire away. So if everyone can just kind of keep that in mind moving forward, that would be great and very much appreciated. So thanks, Alex. Alex, thanks for coming back on. I think this is your third time on the channel now, I think. Third. Yeah, it's, it's getting to be a regular thing. I really enjoy it every time, so I'm pleased to be here. Well, thanks for coming on again. Like I said, uh, when you you just gave me the idea because you're like, I want to come on for Normandy. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I want to come on. <laughs> you're like, maybe air power, <laughs> maybe, I don't know. We'll decide. And then one day, I think you just sent me a message or put it online. You're like, oh, that's it. I'm doing my thread. And I was like, it's like that Simpsons episode where Homer is making the thing out of... Uh, mashed potatoes he's like i'm going to clown college and i'm just like yeah okay <laughs> just like we're doing this so that was uh very much appreciated to, to have that kind of uh that area uh covered for this because like i said wanting i wanted to do more with the sectors and get into this and that's kind of the the look or sorry the approach you're taking today is looking at the sector itself not just one unit in particular like we've had on the channel in the past particularly for this theme month but uh for the sector itself yeah, absolutely. It's it's it was pretty exciting to research and to bring in all these different stories and, and units, um, and people will see why I picked Mike Red Sector as the <laughs> as the presentation rolls on. And yes, it'll become alarmingly them, clear. Yes, many, many of them already probably know why, especially I think if you they've could been probably to our guess. museum. And we're probably um, going to give it away with the first slide here. Oh, absolutely. If, if you know so, the map at all. You know. <laughs> so, yes, there's basically Mike Red Sector, um, and I'll get into precisely what I'm talking about in a second. What I'll do is I'll start kind of big picture, what is D-Day, uh, you know, all that stuff, and then we'll zoom in uh, uh, to get to the sector and to start to unpack the various pieces around that. Uh, before I get going really today, I wanted to dedicate this presentation um, to, to Rifleman Wilfred Joseph Nabish. I think I don't know if I'm pronouncing that last name correctly. Um, he was an Ojibwe uh, from uh, Eagle Lake uh, or Eagle River in Ontario, Eagle Lake Reserve, but Eagle River is the town in Ontario. Um, and he was killed on June 6, 1944 on Mike Red Sector. And I will get into kind of what we know about how he died uh, later in the presentation. Uh, but, you know, he joined, uh, he was the oldest of eight siblings, uh, two who passed during the war before eight months. He was a lumber and paper industry laborer out in, you know, northern Ontario. He enlisted with the PPCLI in September of 41, went overseas to the UK in mid-1942, joined the RWR shortly after the Dieppe Raid, or just before actually the Dieppe Raid, and was killed in action on June 6th, uh, 1944, and he was 21 years old. And I just felt today's, you know, National uh, Indigenous Peoples Day, why not dedicate it to him? Because I was already going to talk about his story. So zooming out, as I said, uh, the situation in Europe, spring 1944, right? The Second World War began in 1939. In 1940, the Germans had some pretty astounding successes in uh, the Low Countries and in France and before that in Norway, you know, Denmark, uh, what have you. Um, and so, you know, France in particular, but Western Europe was under Nazi occupation 
for about four years. And the only way for the Allies to resolve that situation uh, and to defeat Nazi Germany was to return to Europe and destroy the Nazi Germans, Nazi Germany's armed forces and its capacity to wage war. You can see on this map, this is kind of the Nazi occupation just before D-Day in 1944. You've got at the very bottom there, the Italian boot is starting to be conquered or liberated, depending on your perspective. Uh, and, you know, the <laughs> Italians did switch sides in the war. Uh, you know, the fighting on the Eastern Front is still, you know, very brutal, still happening. And, you know, the, the Germans, even though they're being starting to be pushed back by the Russians, are still in, you know, Soviet, you know, Russian territory. Um, and... The other side of it, of course, with the map being so red, is, you know, the Allies needed to not just crush the German armed forces, but they needed to liberate Europe uh, from the German occupation as well. And, and that is ultimately, uh, you know, why they came uh, to Normandy. So D-Day and the Battle of Normandy, what can we say about it that hasn't already been said? Uh, many of you will know uh, at least something about this. Uh, but I also, I always make, 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 make sure to note it is the largest combined military operation in history. It is not the mm. largest military operation in history. It is not even the largest amphibious landing in history. In fact, the invasion of Sicily in 1943 was larger from an amphibious perspective. Um, but when you add in the aircraft and you add in the sea lift and you add that all together, then you get the largest combined operation in military history. Uh, so I always like to make that point. You have almost, you know, 11,600 aircraft, uh, almost 7,000 ships and landing craft of various sizes, 133,000 seaborne troops, and about 156,000 troops overall uh, involved on DA, and of course, you know, hundreds of thousands more to follow on in the weeks and even months, well, days, weeks, and months uh, uh, following. You'll see some interesting, you know, photos there, mostly of Juneau Beach. Uh, the top right is Bernier-sur-Mer and the landing of the 9th uh, Brigade on the kind of late morning, early afternoon of D-Day. You've also got, I believe these are engineers, uh, possibly not even Canadian engineers landing on Juneau Beach. Um, on the bottom left, you have a Spitfire of, I believe it's 402 Squadron, but I might be getting that wrong. Uh, I think it's a DB is the squadron code there getting painted up with its D-Day invasion stripes. Of course, you can see that they're a little roughed in. They're not as kind of pretty as, you know, some of the ones that perhaps are on your die-cast models or uh, on, on, you know, rec museum pieces. Yeah. Um, and then you have uh, actually a picture here in the bottom right, kind of close to where we're going to be talking about today. This is more of Mike Green than it is Mike Red, though there is a little bit of Mike Red in it. Basically, the road that's that's moving kind of from the beach in, in inland there is kind of the delineator between the two uh, sectors, but we'll get into that in a little bit. Canada on D-Day, you know, here's kind of some overall figures. You know, 21,000 troops landed on Juneau Beach, of which 14,000 to 15,000 were Canadian, about 7,000 were British. Uh, the RCAF had 39 squadrons committed. That's pretty much almost all of our overseas squadrons were committed to this operation. Not quite all of them, but most of them, the vast majority of them. Um, 22 airmen killed. We often, you know, forget the airmen who were killed on D-Day as well. Um, the Royal Canadian Navy had 61 major warships. Um, in fact, there were more, this is in the official history of the Royal Canadian Navy, there were more major Canadian warships there on D-Day than there were U.S. Navy warships. Now, yep. they had bigger ones, they had cruisers, they had battleships, but anything from a destroyer to a, um, uh, to a minesweeper, we had more of them. <laughs> so that's an interesting fact. Uh, of course, the 1st Canadian Parachute Battalion went in on the eastern flank of the landings. Uh, we had over 500 paratroopers uh, involved with that operation. Uh, most of the, those who were captured, the Canadians captured on D-Day, were part of those units. Um, and then on Juneau Beach, our casualties were 340 soldiers killed, 574 wounded, and 47 captured on or beyond the beach. So not just most of those, perhaps 80%, I guess, something like that. Yeah. were, you know, breaching the beach defenses, uh, but there were others who were killed, wounded, what have you, uh, beyond those beach defenses and then the second line defenses and so on. Um, so there's some totals on there for you. Often it's been seen as 359 killed on D-Day. You'll see that almost everywhere. That is just Canadian Army. That is not including the Air Force. And, and we didn't find any naval casualties from that day, actually. Fatal right. casualties, I should say, um, though I wouldn't be surprised if there were a couple, uh, but we didn't find any. Um, 
anyway, where does this all take place? So uh, this is a lovely map from C.P. Stacey's The Victory Campaign showing the Allied concentration and routes to get to Juneau Beach and to Normandy more generally. Uh, you can see where 3rd Canadian Infantry Division is near Portsmouth there. You can also see where 2nd Canadian Corps is there uh, uh, out in, uh, I guess that's is that Kent, I think. I can't remember. Uh, I don't know why. England geography well enough, but anyway, <laughs> there's the, they're they're playing an important role in deception, which I think Mark Milner spoke about a couple of oh, weeks ago time. on this very channel. So that's where we're that's where we're dealing with. We're going to zoom in a little bit more. Here's Juno Beach, a lovely map map by Mike Bechtold. He made this for the Juno Beach Center a few years ago. Um, you can see the Canadians are sandwiched in between the British 50th Division on Gold and the Third uh, British Division on Sword Beach. Uh, you know, 3rd Canadian Infantry Division on Juno in the middle, with, of course, attached units from uh, the, the British Army as well. The Juno Beach Centre is fairly clearly marked on this map uh, with a nice little maple leaf, and it is that sector that we're going to be talking about today, where the Royal Winnipeg Rifles landed with a squadron of the 1st Hussars. Um, only have kind of the intermediate objective on this particular map, uh, where the Canadians were supposed to get to. Um, hopefully, they were supposed to get even further inland, actually, by the end of D-Day, but they certainly got mostly to their intermediate objectives, uh, with the Royal Winnipeg Rifles eventually ending up in uh, Crudy at, at the end of the day, uh, which is, interestingly, that'll come up again. That is where Montgomery set up his 21st Army Group headquarters eventually, so you know, the Winnipegs uh, made sure that, to hand that over to him. Um, again, zooming in a little bit more, it's getting a little blurrier now. Um, we're going to be talking about Royal Winnipeg Rifles with Air Squadron of the First Hazars and some more. Uh, not just them, but that's the sector we're going to be zooming in on. And here we have, this is an even better map for our purposes, CP Stacey's Map 2 in the Victory Campaign. You have the various sectors. Uh, they, they, they call them Mike Beach, Nan Beach, and then the sectors are green, red, green, white, and red. We are specifically focused on Mike Red Sector, which is the sector uh, basically on the uh, western side of the Souls River, uh, right where the Juno Beach Center exists today, uh, kind of in a weird geographic position uh, all along the bend of a river, which we'll get into um, in a moment. So, uh, whoops, I think I double clicked. Oh, no, I didn't. Okay. No, this didn't. is, the, yeah, this is my geography. The train of Mike Red. This is pretty much an image, like an air, like a probably a drone photograph of Mike Red Beach. Uh, Mike Red Beach running from basically the little bit of kind of wooden, I guess that would be like, um, it's a walkway. Like it's a, you can go out. Yeah. And, and, boardwalk. And get, and, yeah, boardwalk. That would be on the other side of the Souls River. Uh, the uh so it would the, the mike red sector would run basically from the closer side of the souls river to just beyond where the cross uh croix de lorraine is here in the foreground and so that's the sector we're looking at it's quite an interesting sector in terms of geography and use top topography this all along kind of this here is is dunes it's all dunes um which have been kind of cordoned off so that people can't walk on them to preserve the dunes in the present. And that has some interesting, the dunes have some interesting impacts on, you know, what the battlefield looks like today, what the battlefield looked like back in 1944. So anyway, Mike Red is approximately one kilometer of beach, again, just west of the Quad de Lorraine, uh, running just west from the Quad de Lorraine in the west to the entrance to the harbor in the east. The sand dunes are formed by drift along the coast that comes from west to east, so it deposits the sediment in the sand um, as the tide kind of comes in over over time, and you know that's what forms the dunes and shapes them and allows them to build up. Today, the dunes are much larger than during the war, and so the the high water mark today is further out to sea, and the dunes have now hidden many of the bunkers in the area. They've literally consumed the bunkers, and many of the bunkers have become buried under the dunes. And in fact, the bunkers where they exist today, and you can't really see any of them in this photograph, but I'll get to them in a second, are now behind the dunes when they were right on the beach during the Second World War. And we have some photos of that, and actually of shortly after the war, that gives you kind of a better idea of, of where everything um, exists. So the buildup of the dunes is what blocks the Sewell's River. So that's this river here that meanders 
all the way to the coast and kind of this is kind of the harbor area here and then the souls kind of empties out into the channel over here um it the, the dunes blocks the souls river from direct access to the sea and that's why you have this kind of meandering course and it's forced into a loop um inside the loop during the war there was it was largely waste area or there were oyster beds which i believe are these kind of patches here uh, but i'm not i'm not very good at knowing what oyster beds look like personally <laughs> but the area in here where the river kind of you know there's there's kind of a small kind of river bit here but then the main river's over here as well it kind of forms an island here and that's why they called it some of the original you know documents call it the island uh, because it was kind of an isolated pocket that, you know, um, which is separate. You know, there's a couple of buildings and that sort of thing. Um, but the main town is over on the other side of the river, which the Regina Rifles would, would, would storm. And the Winnipegs would eventually join them in the town as well. Um, and we'll get to that eventually. Um, it was this sector of the beach along the beach in Mike Red. There were very few landmarks in the area. As you can see, it wasn't very built up at the time. And this is a post-D-Day photograph after the Allies have come in and actually turned this into kind of a logistics area. So there's perhaps more, you can see kind of barges and landing craft kind of strewn about. And, and that's the result of the Allies doing their thing. Um, talking a little bit about the German defenses in the area. So we're talking specifically about this big bundle of defenses right in here known as Strong Point Core Souls. And this was part of the most heavily fortified area of the Anglo-Canadian landing sector. So you had uh, Mike Red on the one hand, and then you had the beach that the Reginas uh, landed on on the other hand into the main town. Together, those were strong point core souls, and together they were one of the, the most heavily fortified you know, coastal area that Anglo-American troops attacked on D-Day. And the reason is, well, there's a, there's a harbor here. There's, you know, core souls is a small but a useful harbor, and, and they, the Germans tended to defend those. Um, so the German defenders consisted of the 6th Company. This is on the Mike Red side only. The 6th Company of the 760, 36th Infantry Regiment, which is from the 716th Infantry Division, you know, a static infantry division. The company was led, and I don't have his whole name, I just have his last name, uh, Hauptmann or Captain Grote. And uh, he wasn't all that, even in spite of the fact that uh, this was one of the more heavily defended areas of the Anglo-Canadian landing sector, he wasn't all that pleased with the layout of his defenses. Nevertheless, they were quite formidable. So in that kind of kilometer stretch, there were approximately 30 fortifications. That includes things like trenches, um, dugouts, uh, pillboxes, you know, bunkers, um, mortar positions, Tobruk machine gun emplacements, that sort of thing. The, the main guns that were in the area were, I believe, and some accounts differ, um, but one seven and a half centimeter field gun and two five centimeter anti-tank guns. It may be actually flipped. There may have been one five centimeter and two 7.5s. Depends on which source you look at. But I think it was, I think it was the one 7.5 and the two fives based on kind of German sources I've looked at, or at least secondary sources that have examined German sources. Yeah. Right. There were six uh, concrete machine gun posts uh, covering various aspects of these positions. And then there were mortar teams with carefully registered plots of the beach as well, you know, in, in support. You can also see from this map that this is kind of a hive of German reserves in this area between kind of Corsoles and Montfleury. Um, as well, you have the 441st uh, Ost Battalion uh, in their headquarters, and then you have the 2nd Battalion headquarters uh, for the regiment that the 6th Company was uh, based with. Also, a lot of guns, let me zoom in here, a lot of guns ringing, you know, basically the Corsoles area. You did have the Montfleury Battery, which, although the, the guns actually turned out they weren't ready to go yet, uh, but there were other gun positions that uh, were kind of interested in helping to defend uh, this area. Uh, let me see here. Uh, yeah, that's that's what I had for that. A little note about the 716th Division. Um, they had many under and over age troops, uh, and they were about 15 to 20% foreign troops as well. But they had good NCOs who had been sent from other theaters for rest. So 
just a, a fine unit for holding a position like this, right? You know, they're not probably the best, most motivated troops, but if you give them a machine gun or a couple of rifles and a machine gun and a gun or something, you know, they can hold up an advance, you know, even a pretty determined one because uh, they're in good, good positions. So here are the German, a, a nice map. This is actually just outside of the Juno Beach Center. You can check this mm -hmm. map out. Um, yeah. Uh, but basically kind of a detail of the German positions in Mike Red Sector. And I'm going to actually, I have photos of pretty much all of these, all of the major bunkers here. But anyway, you basically had a, the, one of the five centimeter guns was over here in a ring stand, uh, which was covered by um, a machine gun position. You can see that these bunkers, these, these two bunkers here, they have kind of a little protruding segment. You can kind of see that, and I'll try to zoom in, make sure people can see that okay. You see this little protruding piece? That's because the gun, there, there are no openings on the, the coastal side of the position, right? The opening yeah. is over here. The opening is, the gun is sitting here and it's aiming down the beach in an, in an enfilade position, right? And so this yeah. one's actually kind of covering Mike Green, which is down here. This one over here, which we'll talk about in a bit, is covering this kind of sector. And then the one down here, a little bit different circumstance. Um, this one actually had, um, this one could actually uh, have gun positions that fired both ways uh, because it was at both covering the harbor and covering this this kind of part of uh, Mike Red Beach as well. And that was another five centimeter gun there. And the 7.5 was in the middle position. Um, you also had, uh, and I'm gonna, again, I'll show more photos later of, of these positions. Uh, you also had, um, R666, uh, which is an observation bunker. Uh, and then Haltman Groth's headquarters was in here, which was an underground command post. That again, these two locations you can actually visit um, on a tour when you visit the Juno Beach Center. Also a number of Trebrook or other positions. A lot of the mortars were back in here. You know, they had a series of trench lines and uh, connected these positions. So that's a bit of detail uh, on those on those defenses. Very very tough uh, nut to crack for sure. Yeah. So what did the Allies try to do to give the troops as much support as possible um, uh, for their assault? Um, well, there was a naval bombardment. Um, it must be said that the force bombarding Juno was relatively light compared to Sword and Gold. Uh, those two beaches, I believe, had you know full battleships, the largest kind of ship that we had supporting us was a was a, a town class cruiser the hms belfast which i visited in 2016 and have that lovely photo of its six inch guns yes. um there were a bunch of uh, other destroyers uh, in the bombardment force into including two canadian destroyers hm hmcs soy or sue and hmcs algonquin mm -hmm. and uh you've got some photos there of uh, the sue preparing for d-day uh with the crew getting ready and then you have HMCS Algonquin. I believe those were, these were both D-class destroyers, even though they were named after tribes. Um, uh, and so some people kind of think they're tribals, but they're, they're not tribals. They're, they're not. They're D-class destroyers. Yeah. So um, oh, the bombard, you will, I'll get to the bombardment in a second, but I do have this lovely account, uh, maybe not lovely account, this account from a Frenchman from corsol mm. sur mer talking about the bombardment, Charles Lamonte. And this is an account from the 1970s. He said, it was daylight when a constant roar echoed with crackling, hissing, and explosions. I realized it was a barrage. Undoubtedly, many war warships watered the ground. The crash faded and suddenly went out, not for a long time. Uh, not Yeah. He, re he resumed with, it's a little bit awkward because it's translated from French. He resumed with violence that seemed to be increased, then ceased again. At the, third, at the third salvo, I thought it was the end. Tiles fell in the courtyard. The door and the window of the hall were torn from their hinges. A cloud of pungent smoke fills all the rooms. I remember seeing that cow running down the street at a gallop, mooing with terror. So there were civilians, of course, still in corso sur mer and they experienced this as well. The I can say a little bit more about the air bombardment, um, uh, just because I'm an air guy, and so I knew kind of better where to look, <laughs> I suppose. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, basically, uh, this is an image of the 8th Air Force D-Day plan, but I'll go over kind of some of the plans in detail. So I noted the Montfleury battery, which is nearby. It was an unfinished gun position with four 122 millimeter Soviet guns that had been captured. 
This was targeted by Bomber Command um, before uh, the operation. So 114 heavy bombers attacked between uh, 0429 and 0449 hours. They dropped 542 tons of bombs. No damage was caused to the guns, but the guns were not in operation in the first place. So uh, it didn't actually tend to matter all that much. Um, now, the beach defenses on Juno, that was the task of the United States Army Air Force primarily to bomb, and that's what this uh, map and image is, 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 is depicting, at least their plan. The first bomb division, the United States Army Air Force, uh, would target, and they're in the middle. There's the second bomb division uh, targeting kind of half of, uh, or, or I should say, Omaha Beach. The third bomb division targeting um, Sword Beach and half of Juno Beach. And then the first bomb division targeted Gold and half of Juneau Beach, basically. And so there were 100 and, uh, 125 U.S. aircraft also returned to Montfleury uh, later in the morning to hit that target again. And then 60 B-17s were assigned to Strong Point Corsol. So basically the combination of the Regina's you know, targets and the Winnipeg's targets. Unfortunately, the bombers basically missed the targets on the beaches. And this was, uh, I think this was uh, spoken of uh, in... Um, your, your previous sort of couple shows ago when we talked about the, the, the air battle or the, the aviation involved in the Battle yep. of Normandy, the bombers missed their targets. Basically, yep. someone had the, the perhaps bright idea. They didn't want to bomb uh, incorrectly and hit the landing craft off, offshore. So they decided to de impose a, de a bomb release delay across the board. As a result, the bombs, and what they were doing is they were bombing based, even though it was a bit overcast and everything, they were bombing based on H2S, I think it is, in the American terms. It's basically a ground scanning radar that gives you kind of a picture of the ground. And it works really well on coastlines because the coastline shows up really well on it. The issue was they weren't going to bomb when they saw the coastline, you know, in their crosshairs. They were going to wait like 60 seconds or 90 seconds, I can't remember what it was, and then hit the drop bombs button. Of course, that meant that most of the bombs fell further inland. The village of Corsoles itself was hit particularly hard. Fourteen civilians were killed, including a family of three with a three-month-old child. A dozen, there was kind of close air support, if you will, from fighter bombers, um, though it was, you know, it was pre-planned, not necessarily on call. About a dozen um, Hawker Typhoons of 439 Squadron or CAF actually attacked two gun batteries behind Corsoles with... Um, uh, basically 24,000 pound bombs. They took off at 0700 hours and landed at 0815 hours. Um, basically what their job was to do when they kind of came over the beachhead or got almost to their target was they would call the local headquarters ship. And so for Juno, that was HMS Hillary. And they would ask, do you have any targets for us that we should strike instead of the pre-planned target? They were told, no, we don't have anything. <laughs> the reason being the troops hadn't landed yet because the troops were going to be late. And so they went ahead and attacked uh, their normal targets, which were those gun positions. So the, the, the basically very few bombs at all are falling on the Mike Red beach defenses themselves. Let's put it that way. There may be some kind of backfill from the, the, the heavy bombers, but it certainly wasn't their, necessarily their aiming point um, uh, when it came down to things. You can kind of see maybe some evidence of this. This is an aerial reconnaissance photograph from what I think is probably a P-38. And it is, you know, showing bits of Corsals uh, on fire because of the bombardment that's 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 hit um, uh, the town. You can see in the distance, this is kind of Mike Red in here with that little kind of triangular kind of peninsula. And you can see landing craft kind of going to and fro um, offshore. This is a little bit later in the day. Um, Another great kind of overhead uh, aerial reconnaissance uh, image um, of, of, of Mike Red. And again, this is the Regina sector over here. Uh, this is Mike Red in here. Basically, everything kind of on this side of the road, pretty much. And then you have Mike Green down here. And you can see a whole bunch of landing craft tanks and a whole bunch of vehicles that they have presumably landed or in the process of landing trying to find exits off the beach. Uh, and you can see it's quite congested because I guess they haven't found their exits or, or cleared their exits quite yet uh, in this image. Um, you can also see some of the evidence of the uh, missed aerial bombardment as well. 
there are some kind of craters, cratering kind of in here. I don't know if you can see it all that well. I'll try to zoom in a little bit of cratering here, uh, but there's also cratering way out here <laughs> in the fields. So you can see some of that, that the evidence of, of the bombardment. Um, you can also see that some of the you can see I think this is you know smoke kind of billowing from the town in kind of yep. the same location we saw in the other uh, from the other perspective. We also got uh, again this is kind of probably close to around the same time it looks almost like uh, because of the position of the landing craft and everything and you can see those fires and the damaged buildings from you know the vagina's assault over here. Um, uh, and what's going on in the town there. And that's so it's a great shot. This is, again, pretty much Mike Red right in here with that little triangle. So recognizable. It's great trying to look for these. In, you know, if, if you're in an archive, trying to look for this. Yeah. This You look for this, it's, it's unmistakable. You can absolutely see the curvature of the river and the, 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 yeah. the harbor. And the, and the, and that's, and uh, sorry, just, well, I'll give you a break there for a second. That's, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's always what I look for. I mean, any, if you're trying to go any other direction... <laughs> It gets a little yeah, tricky. east or but west. <laughs> as long as you have the whole river, you're like, uh, yeah. And then after that, you're kind of like, oh, we can work our way across, depending on the landmarks. But again, after a while, depending, because again, I've used, done this myself, right? Because I did stuff with the first Azars, as a lot of you know. Um, and Scott was watching a big fan of the first Azars because he had a rel uh, an ancestor, his great grandfather, mm -hmm. I believe, in the First World War with them, which is interesting. Had a little side chat there about what a Hussar even is, which is always interesting. <laughs> we had the, the little side chat conversations that happened. Uh, anyway, but yeah, trying to, to narrow down the areas can be tricky, uh, especially if the photos originally weren't, you know, filed correctly, um, which can be a bit of a pain. Uh, but anyway, this is the one area that you can be like, yeah, I know exactly where that is. It's, it's one of the few. Absolutely. Any any questions so far yet, or are we just... Uh, no, just some clarifications. Um, the Great Dominion who's, uh, watches a lot of the shows. Again, thank you. Uh, the uh, H2X was the American version of the h2 i had a, i had a, i had a 50 50 shot yeah it's I, one of those I ones failed. yeah you know you just take a shot in the dark <laughs> and uh, flip the coin and you hope for the best uh uh no um we have another we had a question but i want to save it for the end okay great um so getting into the assault force uh for mike red i tried to get as many of these uh cats <laughs> like as i could find yeah, um cool. so you can see top left underneath the title you have the royal winnipeg rifles and then we've got the Royal Canadian Artillery, of course, because, uh, well, we're going to talk about them. A uh, couple of units involved here in particular. Um, we have the Royal Canadian Engineers cap badge. We also have the Royal Engineers cap badge. And uh, we'll get into uh, why those are involved. The first is ours, of course, as we've mentioned. We've got the, uh, the 22nd uh, Dragoons, again, which I'll talk about in a second. And the Royal Marine... Um, well, it's the Royal Marines uh, cap badge, but it's uh, it's for the um, uh, Royal, uh, the second Royal Marine Armored Support Regiment, uh, which had centaurs, uh, which I believe had 95 millimeter guns on them, which were quite helpful at certain times for breaching uh, heavy defenses and things like that. The reason I have the um, Royal Engineers there is because, uh, and of course, I'm going out of order now that, that I've done this. Um, we had we had the second troop of the 26th Assault Squadron, Royal Engineers, and Armored Vehicle Royal Engineers, the Churchill uh, um, uh, AVREs. Uh, so they were there. Uh, again, 22nd Dragoons B Squadron, and they had Sherman Crabs uh, for clearing minefields and the like. Um, and that's the Specialized Armored Support. Of course, the, uh, the first is ours. Uh, are the regular uh, DD, uh, Duplex Drive Armored Support with A Squadron First Desires. We'll talk about them a little bit more. The Assault Engineers um, were, I hesitate to call them Assault Engineers, those poor buggers, and I'll talk, talk about why. Uh, but number six, Field Company, Royal Canadian Engineers. There were uh, 19 of them uh, who were embedded with B Company of the Royal Winnipeg Rifles, who I'll be talking about, and specifically I will be talking about B Company Royal Winnipeg Rifles um, as they did most of the heavy lifting um, to capture uh, Mike Red. So that's your assault force, if you will. There are other elements that I have not included here necessarily. Um, I also want to uh, indicate, um, I'm going to go back, uh, see if I can go, oh, go forward one slide here. Uh, again, another image, one of the, I think this is the image you used, Brad, for the show. Maybe I'm wrong. I can't yeah. remember. It's an image that I, I used earlier, uh, kind of the junction of Mike Red and Mike Green. 
Uh, but I used it because of all the landing craft. You can see yeah, you know, right. a mixture of you know, LCAs and LCTs and perhaps yeah. other things um, in there. But I wanted to also give a shout out to the uh, Royal Navy in particular, who provided the landing craft uh, for this operation and you know who mostly got the folks at the right places, maybe not at the right times, but that wasn't necessarily all their fault. Um, so you had the first Hazars, for instance, were aboard landing craft tanks from the fourth landing craft tank, Fatilla. The breaching teams, which were the 26th Assault Squadron and the squadron uh, 22nd Dragoons, were with the 162nd landing craft tank, Flotilla. The second Royal Marine Armored Support Regiment were aboard uh, LCTAs um, of the 105th landing craft tank, Flotilla. And B Company, the Royal Winnipeg Rifles, and the engineers that were with them that I'll be talking about came ashore with the 516th Assault Flotilla, and they came across the channel on the SS Laird's Isle. That was their landing ship. Uh, so just to make sure we don't forget the Royal Navy and the important role that it played, of course, not just in the bombardment, uh, but rather um, also uh, on, on you know getting people to where they needed to be. Um, again, the bombardment, just to kind of follow up on that, uh, and I'll, I'll follow up on a little bit more, very minimal effectiveness. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit more here with discussions of the 12th Field Artillery Regiment, RCA. The other thing about the bombardment is a lot of the bombardment, just like I indicated with some of the air support, it wasn't necessarily at the beach itself and the beach defenses themselves. It was focused further afield on those guns that I was telling you, you all about. Um, and so, you know, the fire was split because it had to take care of both tasks. Now, this is a bit of a different case where what they did with the 12th Field Regiment, which had... M7 priests, uh, which were, you know, on uh, 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 landing craft, and they would actually fire from the decks of those landing craft um, as they approached the beach. Uh, and actually, they would fire. Their, their aiming point, I literally looked it up. Um, I looked up the map reference, and it's literally almost like just behind where the Juno Beach Center exists today. Um, mm -hmm. It was their kind of main central aiming point. So on the run-in, their job was to fire from their decks. Um, they were basically supposedly kind of firing at one of the gun positions perhaps the 75 uh the 75 yeah, right. centimeter gun was kind of where they were you know mainly trying to get um the actual location of their fire i, I kind of lied a little bit it's not quite the Joe beach center it's more the sailing club which is right next to where the uh 7.5 is and i'll show people where the sailing club is later um so they started their ranging shots from just over 10,000 yards 10,600 yards at 35 minutes prior to h hour h hour was supposed to be 0735 and i'll talk a little bit more about why that was uh, but basically they started at 0700 hours their ranging shots they fired for effect from 9600 yards at h minus 32 so three minutes later at 703 that continued until 1500 yards from shore at h plus seven uh, which is 0742 hours so they're firing for almost 40 minutes um, when their ammunition was expended. They shot everything they brought aboard them uh, on the LCTs, pretty much. Uh, they fired 100 rounds per gun, and that was from 24 guns, so around 2,400 rounds. Uh, the craft then circled off, so they could be out of the way for the uh, LCTs and the uh, LCAs, you know, trying to make the beach. Um, the regiment itself, the 12th Field Regiment, just because I don't want to forget to pick this up later, they landed about an hour after what HR was supposed to be at 0830 hours. And they took up a gun position on, over the, uh, on the beach and started to engage the enemy of, over open sites when they had you know, their uh, restocks of ammunition. Um, basically, they were trying to suppress the snipers and the mortars that were still taking their toll kind of on the assault area. Um, all guns of the regiment were not ashore until H plus seven hours. So it took quite a while for everything to get ashore based on the congestion and everything. Their assessment, um, well, not just their assessment, but operational researchers' ass assessment of yeah. their assessment was they had actually done quite well. That's what their, you know, forward officer, uh, not forward officer bombardment, but their forward observation officer had said, oh, yeah, we probably silenced a gun position. Um, but the operational researchers kind of came in, did their thing, and found that the effects of the fire were largely limited. Some communication trenches had collapsed, but there was no damage to the concrete positions, and to be fair, you know, it would have taken a direct hit, you know, through the embrasure yeah. to do anything really other than suppress, right? Um, yeah. And so suppression was the big thing they were going for. Unfortunately, yeah. as well, for reasons I'll get to in a little bit, um, the guns, you know, they did fire. Uh, 
they did fire until um, 0742 hours. Unfortunately, our best estimate is that the Royal Winnipeg rifles in particular landed after that. So there was time potentially for the, the defenders to recover. Yep. And uh, that's what we'll, you, yeah. right there for, go for it. Um, we'll go back to so, uh, Well, actually, it's a question about the LCTs. Um, and you've looked at this more recently than I have. I can't remember off the top of my head, but how many tanks were in standard LCT? Oh, I that think account? it was between three and five. Yeah, that's what I remember. Um, I think. I just I can't quite remember. Um, yeah. Yeah, now it's coming back to me. Yeah, three and five. Sometimes they would try to cram one more in, uh, depending on what they were trying to do. Um, like again, we can probably talk about this in a bit. But the difference. I might, I might even have it in my notes, considering um, I do talk <laughs> about the uh, the first yeah. desires in a little bit. So maybe we'll get an answer. Or maybe that'll that come up from here. my notes. And um, uh, this is this is a good one. Sorry. So yeah, we'll yeah. come to that one possibly. Yeah. And because this is a good question, I don't want to forget it. Is the was there any barrage balloon teams? That came ashore. You know what? I'm not sure. Um, I yeah. have a feeling there probably were eventually. Um, eventually, yes. I'm, I don't get into kind of too much of the follow along forces in this yep. uh, particular presentation. Yeah, we're doing the assault here. But, um, but yeah, I'm sure they had some. I mean, it was a port, right? Like it, you know, it, it would, you know, start operating kind of like one. So it might not have been as important as like Aramosh or anything eventually, yeah. or like Omaha with the uh, Mulberry Harbor. But I could, you know, I'm sure there probably were some barrage balloon teams and certainly. There were beach commandos. Uh, first, uh, they would have been British, and then eventually uh, yep. the W commando of the Royal Canadian Navy arrived in July. Uh, yes, and they would have been helping to manage the flow of materials across the beach and everything like that. Yeah, and I and I can't say for sure about this sector uh, for the sorry for the barrage balloon element, but I know again it's kind of the details are a bit hazy, but photos and video from a few days later shows them in the background at, at Bernays. Oh, okay, so they're clearly brought in at some point. <laughs> so. Uh, I just don't know about this particular part, but again, it yeah, wouldn't surprise me. If they were. Yeah, and I mean, if they were at Bernier, sir, Mary, you'd think they would be here because this was more of a, like, on June 6th, Bernier was more of a logistical node, yes. but but later on it turned yes. to their soul, so I would expect them to be here as well. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Uh, no, we got an answer. For, well, it's about the, the M7 priests on the LCTs, about four of them plus light yeah. vehicles, but... Yeah. The, the, well, yeah, you, you could probably fit, you could probably fit more priests on because it's the same chassis, right? As like a yeah. Sherman, but they don't have the DD screens. Yeah, exactly. So you could probably fit fit a couple more things on there as well. Yeah. Yeah, and plus light vehicles, like support vehicles. But yeah, yeah. they they I know they yeah, it was usually I think you're right between three and five because I just well we'll get to it in a second. But uh, yeah, continue on with the with the with the Winnipegs here. Yeah, so we're gonna talk about B Company Row Winnipeg rifles. Um, and you've got this quote. This is perhaps the most quoted war yeah. diary entry I've ever seen. Um, the bombardment having failed to kill a single German or silence one weapon, these companies had to storm their positions cold and did so without hesitation. That was their entry for the 6th of June, 1944. And I think some of the, that is the thing about this particular story, I think is, you know, the Atlantic wall wasn't really a wall, but it had a, it was like a rope with a bunch of knots in it. And Corsoles was certainly one of those bigger knots. And this was a tough, a tough fight, and it was even made even tougher by the fact that, unfortunately, the bombardment didn't really do the job that was hoped it could. Um, and you know, yeah. I don't think too many people expected it would destroy everything and it would just be a cakewalk, but they expected it to have some effect, and it had a very minimal effect, unfortunately. Partly because, again, they landed the Royal Winnipeg rifles themselves landed at approximately zero seven forty nine hours. At least that's what the war diary says. It might have been a little bit before that but it was certainly later than 0735 hours. And so all the bombardment, everything was timed to, to take place at 0735. And if you're too late, unfortunately, you've no longer got the, you know, you've no longer got that support. You know, the, the 12th field fired until 0742. So maybe they got some suppression from that if they landed a little bit earlier, but yeah. it didn't last very long, right? No. Um, the Winnipegs are basically tasked with assaulting three casemates, and I identified those to you already, the, 50, the 250s and the, and the 175 gun casemates, and perhaps as many as 12 machine gun emplacements. Um, the B, B Company was led by Captain Philip Gower, and he was, I'm going to talk about him more in a second, but he was awarded the Military Cross for his actions on the morning. They also, B Company wasn't on its own necessarily. They also had a reinforced uh, company, uh, which under, uh, had an extra platoon under their command. 
and two sections of number six field company Royal Canadian Engineers. Um, basically, the strengths uh, are listed as 119 men plus Gower, so about 120 men and officers um, for B Company, but I don't think that includes the engineers or number 15 platoon, or right. I think it's, you know, those, those maybe get added separately, or at least part of them, parts of them get added separately, maybe the engineers do. Um, it took them until 0900 hours, uh, so, you know, almost just over an hour, an hour and 10 minutes, approximately an hour and 15 minutes, to secure Mike Red Sector. Uh, number 15 platoon, which was that extra platoon that was added, reported crossing the River Souls right behind where the Juno Beach Centre exists today, and they started clearing out the four, four various positions on the island. At the end of the day, B Company reported 26 other ranks and Gower having survived the assault on the three case casemates unscathed. So everybody else was either killed, wounded, or missing. Um, you know, about, about pro approximately 78% casualties. Um, the, com the, the company sergeant major's account, and this is kind of more perhaps the reinforced company, uh, he, count he said they had 140 guys and that the, 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 the total count at the end of the day was 50. So I think the the 78% the casualties is a B company specifically. The um, uh, 50 out of 140 is probably the extra platoon added in. And so perhaps the extra platoon didn't take as many casualties. Um, and But it's still 64% if you if you include that. So again, very heavy you know casualties in the first wave for sure. Um, I've got three uh, graves um, in front of you here uh, to share some of their stories and the image of Corporal Walter Close. Um, basically, these guys, I'm pretty sure, were all from um, a, one platoon, which is Lieutenant Cozy Bill Aiken's platoon. Uh, Cozy Aiken, his job was to, and his platoon's job was to take out the, the main casemate, the 7.5 centimeter gun casemate, um, which is depicted here. Um, so Lieutenant Aiken was seriously wounded leading the charge against the casemates. Uh, Corporal Bull Walter Close, whose image we saw on the previous slide, was wounded on the beach, but he led his section in uh, assaulting a nearby machine gun nest, and he killed or two or three Germans with his bare hands. Before, before he died. Lance Corporal Leslie Cool. Um, actually, it's kind of something classic out of a movie or something. He put his, or a First World War film or something, he put his body across barbed wire to get his section um, around inland, and he later died of his wounds. He's listed as dying on June 7th, but uh, witnesses say that he actually died on the 6th. Um, you know, it's, you know, the bureaucracy of war. And then rifleman Wilfred uh, Nabish, um, again, uh, the uh, indigenous soldier I spoke about earlier, died trying to cut uh, barbed wire approaching this pillbox and he died uh, with his pack of explosives uh, so he was trying to get to the pillbox to to blow it up uh, but couldn't make it um the reason unfortunately that um the casualties perhaps were so heavy is that the even though the winnipegs were laid in landing uh, also the tanks were laid in landing uh due to the weather primarily and and you can speak more to this Brad about you know decisions whether or not to yep. you know you know deploy the duplex drive tanks or try to land them on the beach that it's the, themselves, uh, but basically, uh, so Gower as I said is awarded the military cross uh, for his leadership that morning. It's like a, I, I read one description. It's like a scene. It's like that scene out of Band of Brothers in, in I think it's episode three when they're assaulting Carantan and. Winters is, is yelling at everybody to get up and go. Um, or or it's it's actually very similar to um, Cecil Merritt at Dieppe. Uh, yeah. Again, same yeah. sort of thing. He's got his helmet off, waving at his, his lads to get moving. Um, okay, I'm just looking at my notes here so I don't lose myself at all. But that's, you know, he, he you know, I, I think it's fair to say that he got this military cross uh, perhaps for everybody. Yeah, I think something. Uh, it, there's a, some reflections uh, from Mike Red Beach from some of the people who were there. I'll share these with you. 
Um, uh, company Sergeant Major Charles Belton, who did those counts. Uh, that's that's what he that's what that, that's kind of his experience. Uh, I won't read it to you because I won't be able to keep going. <laughs> yeah. And Sergeant Johnson of the company led one of the pretty. He led a section, I think, um, uh, a platoon. Once uh, his officer was killed, yeah. I think Gower was the only officer still standing at the end of the day, too. Um, as far as I know, so, yeah. yeah. So, you know. Very, very difficult work. A couple of things uh, that I meant to get to earlier, but I, I'm just getting to now. So so they came ashore late, as I said. Again, their HR was 0735. The reason, so other landings up and down the coast are happening at various times. You know, Utah Beach, I think, starts at 0750 or something like that. Like, you know, more than half an hour earlier. The reason that this was the case on Juno was because they needed the tide to be even higher because... Um, uh, that then at the other beaches because there was a uh, like a, a sandbar or a reef you know offshore yeah. which the landing craft you know especially in front of Bernier sur Mer that the landing craft would get stuck on so that's why they were doing it a little later than on the other beaches so they were going in on a, at, at low tide but it was a rising it was starting to rise already the reason they went in at low tide was to to expose all of those obstacles so that the landing craft didn't bump in bump into them trigger a mine and blow up. Um, but, but because they're landing even later than planned, even later than 0735, the tide is even higher than they had planned, meaning they're, they're dropping into like, you know, waist deep water and trying to trudge their way ashore. Yeah. The LCAs themselves couldn't get in close due to the obstacles again, because the, the tide had already risen a little bit. And so some men, you know, were led off and actually drowned as a result on the way in because they, you know, couldn't get purchase, you know, on, 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 on dry land, yeah. um, or at least on, on wet land below their feet, because they had to try to swim in. Uh, in some cases, they stepped into water over their heads, many lost their equipment on the way in. Um, the obstacles themselves, which were supposed to, you know, the engineers were, were all there with their explosives to hopefully blow, you know, gaps in those. It was much difficult, much more difficult to clear those obstacles because the water was already there. And so that made the work all the more difficult. And then as the tide came in, you know, it brought in with it the wounded as well. So it was, was must have been a gruesome, gruesome scene. <sighs> I want to say something about the engineers. Um, Lieutenant uh, Neil Mustard of the Sixth Field Company, he actually landed with the Reginas, um, and he had, there was a sergeant um, who was with the uh, engineers that was with the, the Winnipegs. Um, but, you know, his platoon, number two platoon, just got absolutely slaughtered on both sides, but especially on the B Company side of the beach. Um, there were 19 engineers, uh, one sergeant, 18 engine, uh, sappers with B Company, um, eight were killed, four were wounded, three were captured, and four were unscathed. So 79% casualties for the engineers. So just about the same number as, as B Company itself, the infantry. Keep in mind, the engineers did not have personal weapons. They were not issued with personal weapons. They may have picked them up as they went up the beach if they made it that far. But they had they had various types of charges for destroying bump, bunkers and beach obstacles. So they had a wade charge, which was a shape charge, and it was a, so for directing explosive force. They had a beehive charge, which was meant to reduce blowback. Um, and these guys, in particular, the engineers, they were tradesmen, right? They were carpenters, tinsmiths, welders, blacksmiths, electricians, plumbers, usually a little older than the infantry, between 25 yeah. and 35, because they had established careers and that sort of thing. But they were not really trained as assault troops. They were not as fit um, as the infantry. They hadn't gone through the same rigorous training as the infantry had. And they had some difficulty keeping up with the infantry in some cases. And I know Lieutenant Mustard was kind of ashamed of this because he thinks it got a lot of good guys killed um, because maybe they shouldn't have been there in the first place. Um, basically, there were six men attached to each of the three platoons in B Company. Um, and then uh, Sergeant F.R. Emerson was the sergeant who was with Company HQ, with B Company, with Gower, um, effectively. Uh, so very heavy casualties among engineers. You know, you can understand, you know, this is why it takes so long to clear this beach, in part because the engineers who are supposed to clear the obstacles, you know, many of them are casualties, uh, you know, first thing. Yep. So I didn't get to the tanks. It's hard to tell this story in kind of a linear fashion and include all elements. So I want to back up a bit, of course, um, and talk about the tanks. So 
A Squadron First Hazars, which was supporting the Royal Winnipeg Rifles, uh, they were supporting both the Mike Red Sector and the Mike Green Sector. Um, so basically, they were supposed to land the duplex drive Sherman tanks. We're supposed to land five minutes before the infantry, but they landed between 10 and 15 minutes late due to rough seas. And there's basically a decision that had to be made around do we deploy the DD tanks yeah. and try to swim in, or do we just try to land, uh, you know, get the LCTs in and try to land the craft that way? This is difficult to do because the issue is um, there's only so much space, right? And so you got to be very careful if you're going to do the LCTs. Well, that's going to create a barrier for the LCAs, maybe not to be able to get up to the beach, right? So it's a tough decision to make. Um, eventually, they made the decision um, to launch uh, most of the DD tanks. Um, only 10 of the A Squadron, I think there were 16 DD yeah. tanks in total, only 10 of them managed to leave the LCTs for the, for the assault. I believe one of the LCTs got hit by um, yeah. a shell, and it stopped the door from opening, so they couldn't. Yeah launch for instance that's one example mm -hmm. so of the 10 that left the lcts for the assault and were you know duplex driving their way um into shore seven touched down uh one of them was actually swamped and hit by um, um, a landing craft a rocket i think or something like that and literally just got run over um this just kind of gives you an indication of like how crowded and congested the space could get yep. um those seven made a huge difference However, once they got there, Big right? Time. So they touched down, they destroyed the beach defenses. They basically claimed, I think they claimed something like two or three or even four 7.5 millimeter guns. I think we know that there were only three guns in total, but they, they got them all. Um, yeah. And they claimed about 13 machine guns. Um, basically, uh, the tanks themselves were held up by mines. Uh, they weren't able to get off the beach immediately. It took them, I think, between an hour and an hour and a half to actually start getting, you know, off the beach into their exits. Um, yeah, the tanks, seven of the ten, uh, again, that launched, one went down in rough seas, one had a screen damaged by mortar fire, one was run down by a rocket craft. Um, six other tanks, the other six tanks in the squadron were brought ashore by LCTs a little bit later. And then three of those were put out of action on the beach or among underwater obstacles. So basically, there were 10 tanks total that survived and moved inland with the infantry, seven that landed wet, and three that landed dry. Um, basically, shortly after the tanks um, deflated their screens and started engaging the fortifications, the enemy began to surrender. So perhaps, you know, absolutely, B Company played a huge role in this. But, you know, at the end of the day, it was really the arrival of the tanks that perhaps saved their bacon a little bit and made sure that, that their assault could continue successfully. Um, this is a really interesting image. This was shared by Stephen Fisher, uh, a couple of, actually back in April, uh, who's on Twitter. Uh, he's a really keen uh, historian of, like, um, all things amphibious. Yes. So, um, you know, yep. um, and, and he had this image. This is Mike Red Beach. Uh, it's kind of hard to make out things. It's not a high resolution image. You can see the obstacles uh, somewhat uncovered there because uh, the tide is out a little bit still in this case. It's not high tide yet. Um, here, it's hard to see. Uh, where's my zoom in? This is the bunker with the five centimeter gun that can fire both ways down the beach and towards the harbor. Uh, it's somewhat hard to make out there, but that is that is what that is right there. Um, you can actually make out a troop of four tanks. One, <laughs> three, two, three, and four. And these are first Hazars tanks. They are certainly, they have the profile of a tank, a Sherman tank with a flotation screen. Um, and they are moving down the beach in the direction of Corsoles. And this guy here kind of looks like Maybe this tank's already backed off. It's kind of hard to tell. Yeah. But this guy here has looks like he's kind of gone up here. And this, by the way, right in here, you can see there's kind of like a little maybe trench line or something. Like, what is that? And, and it goes kind of that way too. This little thing here, this kind of crescent shape here, that is the entrance to the observation bunker right outside the Juno Beach Center. So this tank is basically facing where the Juno Beach Center is today. It's attacking the Juno Beach Center's future site. And uh, just a really cool image to see those tanks. You know, again, they're making the difference here because what probably, what I what I think happened, and if I can go back and find a bit of a better image of the whole thing, most of the landings kind of occurred in here. 
and the German positions are all along here. I think the infantry kind of got like a foothold here, and then the tanks moved this way and tried to, you know, destroy those gun positions yeah. and, and, and silence them as they went down the beach, basically. Yeah, I, I think I, from, again, it's it, it's been a while since I put that video together, but I, I think I agree. It's they land not directly, sorry, the infantry, not directly in front. Um, again, they're not having an easy time, but neither are the tanks. I mean, like you said, a couple are destroy, uh, uh, you know, sink, one goes right in to the surf and doesn't come back up. Um, it's just they're not having an easy time either. But once they hit the shore is when the difference is made. Huge, huge. To, it's a huge difference. Like it's, it, and you're going to get there now, but it's just, it's a, it's a massive difference here. Absolutely. And this is, this is the DSO Distinguished Service Order citation um, for Major William W. Brooks, who commanded a squadron and, you know, made the decision uh, to launch uh, the DD tanks um, of his squadron. Um, and basically, uh, you know, he, he got his DSO for the strong leadership that he exhibited um, in this operation and for making that decision and the fact that his tanks were able to make such a big difference, you know, once they got in. I'm going to read a different, um, uh, this is kind of you know, a nice image of the DD Sherman 5 to give you an idea of what that looks like with the screen down. And then there's another one of the screen down. This is actually, I think, B Squadron. Um, uh, in, uh, yep. Again, supporting the Reginas. Uh, I believe yeah. this is in Corsoles, yeah, on D-Day. But basically, um, mm -hmm. Lieutenant Colonel John Meldrum, who is the CEO of the Royal Winnipeg Rifers, Rifles, wrote, um, A Squadron, commanded by Major Dudley Brooks, literally made possible the overwhelming of the defenses. It will be recalled that the pre-assault bombardment had been either ineffective or non-existent and it, did, and it had not, and had it not been for the gallantry gallantry determination dash and skillful use of firepower on on the part of major brooks and his squadron it is conceivable that this battalion's casualties and those of c company first canadian Sc scottish regiment or first battalion canadian scottish regiment it's an acronym here uh, would have been much heavier and the capture of the beach had greatly delayed so those, you know, again, DSO citation, he made, you know, important decision, but perhaps that stands for the work of the entire squadron in, in the guys who managed to get ashore and the guys, unfortunately, who didn't manage to get ashore, uh, at least not with their tanks. Some of them kind of floated ashore <laughs> yeah. you know, in other ways and that sort of thing. Uh, yeah. But they made a huge difference when they got there. Absolutely. Um, moving away from the... Um, the assault itself, um, eventually, like the, so 13th Field Artillery Regiment is an interesting case because they were actually supporting the Regina Rifles in a very similar role to the 12th Field Regiment as they supported the Royal Winnipeg Rifles. Um, however, the um, uh, they did have to land on Mike Red. There's not enough space on uh, the Regina side of the side of things because it's a, you know, it's a town, you know, and, and when the tide is in... <laughs> It's not much room. <laughs> not much room. Nope. So they 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 start to land here. Um, perhaps their most famous member was Lieutenant James Duhon, who landed with. Uh, he landed at approximately H plus twenty minutes. Um, yeah. So probably the beach defenses were still, you know, being overcome. Um, and he was with a recce party or reconnaissance party, whose job was to set up a gun area for the Union near Grace or Mare, which is the town that's just kind of inland from a junction of Mike Red and Mike Green. And he was a command uh, post officer in the 22nd Battery, which is why he was given this job. Um, most of his unit landed later in the afternoon, again, due to a con congested beach in this area as well. Um, during the course of the day, he stalked two snipers and led his men through a field of anti-tank mines, kind of just south of kind of Grace or Mare. Um, he was wounded and had to be evacuated late in the day. Basically, um, a sentry, I believe, with his regiment, um, uh, with a Bren gun, shot him six times uh, <laughs> when Duhan was too slow with, with the password, unfortunately. Uh, luckily for him, four went into a leg and one severed a finger. Um, and then the final one was stopped at his chest by a cigarette case. So very yep. lucky guy. And of course, he went on, you know, uh, he recovered and actually joined, uh, I can't remember what the number of the squadron is, but uh, he, he started flying like Austers and stuff. And uh, Yeah, he... Late, um... Yeah. Sorry, just to jump in. Yeah, go ahead. That's a, the famous part of the story, right? Other than, you know, he gets wounded on D-Day. Again, there's differing opinions. Sorry, not opinions. Differing stories of what he actually does. There's the one that he leads one of the companies of, of the Regina, which isn't true. <laughs> um, yeah. But, uh, and then there's that. But then, yeah, he recovers. He gets trained to be a, a, an observer in, uh, sorry, for the, 
a pilot. He is trained as a pilot. He does. He gets qualified. He doesn't. I don't think flies any combat missions. Okay. Okay. Because it's too late. It's too but late he's he's missions. known for being one of the craziest pilots in the Canadian Army, which is always misquoted, because <laughs> uh, he was. Uh, he did all kinds of things like flying between buildings, and then they took his wings away because of that. So, and then the of war course. ended anyway. Uh, that's just a quick. Uh, yeah, he was definitely. Uh, an interesting character, that's for sure. And that's well, and completely course, before going on Star Trek. <laughs> and of course, he became known as Scotty, you know, the, the Enterprise's chief engineer in the original Star Trek series. And so, yeah. especially for those of generations before Brad or I, you know, you'll probably remember him quite warmly. I seem to, my best memories of him, I think, were when he came on like the next generation and stuff like that. And, yeah, I remember him later and then just yeah. always all over the place. He was always on. Yeah. Huge star Trek, star Trek profile for sure. He was on lots of stuff. But thank, but thank goodness he made it through D Day because if he didn't, we wouldn't have had Scotty. Yeah. So just to try to wrap things up in the next few minutes, but I want to kind of go over what we've been talking about a bit and talk about Mike Red today. So again, I've got this image, you know, of Mike Red sector. Um, this is Cozy's bunker again, the seven point five centimeter bunker. Um, Eventually, it was silenced, I think, by a, by a Sherman, more than likely, from the first Definitely. Bazaars. Yep. Uh, but that was kind of, this is kind of the main, the Winnipegs were kind of landing in here uh, for the most part. Um, and then eventually, it, like, that image that I showed you of the tank, the, the tanks, the troop of tanks that was moving down the beach, they were headed this way. And the tank, to me, looks like it's trying to go kind of right here, uh, up onto the you know, yep. next to where this is again the observation bunker with the kind of the crescent-shaped entrance um, over there. Um, this is what I'm going to do: is I'm going to start kind of walking Mike Red Beach yeah, from right. from west. This is what I did uh, from from west. So the, the 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 part that's closest to Mike Green, which is closest to Gold Beach, um, to where the Juno Beach Center effectively is, and even beyond that um, to the last kind of bunker. So. Um, this is kind of on the junction of Mike Green and Mike Red, where the um, uh, one Charlie uh, Churchill AVRE with the spigot mortar um, is uh, there as a memorial. Um, this memorial was dedicated on the 50th anniversary of D-Day 1994 uh, to the 26th Assault Squadron, Royal Engineers, that landed around H hour, though I think they were a little bit later. I think them... The Royal uh, Marine uh, Armored Support Regiment and the uh, Sh the, the Sherman uh, Crabs with the flails were all a little bit late, much like the tanks were a little bit late too. Um, everybody was late, everybody was late. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so uh, they landed. And this this um, AVRE was moving inland. You know, after they'd kind of made breaches in the and made you know exits off the beach, it was actually a hundred meters south of this present location when it was knocked out. Um, and all of the crew members were either killed or badly wounded in that incident. It didn't have any, uh, there's a nice plaque on it, but it doesn't have a, a list of names yeah. or anything like that. Um, kind of almost just across the road from that is a parking lot. And at that parking lot, there are a couple of memorials. And I wanted to showcase this one. Um, this is a memorial to the 1st Polish Armored Division. And this is to the point I was trying to make earlier about how the, um, uh, Corsols became a logistical node in Grace or Mare, you know, Mike Red Beach, that area generally, this junction between Mike and Mike Red and Mike Green is where a lot of units came ashore in the days, weeks, and even perhaps months um, after the June 6th landing. And the Poles, although perhaps most of their armored vehicles might have come ashore at Arrow Manche and the Mulberry Harbor there, yeah. um, a lot of their troops came ashore also um, at Juneau uh, uh, at this location. Um, the same can be said of a lot of our 2nd Canadian Infantry Division units. They came, many of them came ashore here. Um, 4th Canadian Armored Division as well, you know, Corps Headquarters, Army Headquarters units, all that stuff. A lot of it came through here. Some of it also came through our march. So sure. it's an interesting, you know, point that Juneau Beach is not just the entry point for 3rd Canadian Infantry Division and 2nd Canadian Armored Brigade, but it's also the entry point, which is hardly covered in any histories of these units because it's such a small point. Yeah. But they all entered France and entered, you know, continental Europe from mostly from this uh, from this spot. Moving to the kind of crust of the enemy defenses, um, this is R623. 
Um, this is the, the westernmost uh, five centimeter gun position. Um, and the five centimeter gun position is actually kind of out of this shot to the left. Um, and this is, um, you've got, you know, you can actually kind of, again, there's this kind of lip here. And it's all, like, half of it's buried by, yeah. by the dune. But there's this lip, right, um, that you can see there. And, again, the gun position, perhaps for a machine gun or something, would have been probably in here enfilading down the beach, right? Over here, it's all solid concrete, right? You, you know, a direct hit by a shell ain't doing much to that. Because it's, you know, that's why it's built that way. Um, so yeah. so that's that's one that's one view of, of, of kind of one gun position. Or at least kind of a view of part from part of that gun position, though it would have been kind of more down the beach to the to the west. Uh, just to the right of that, or to the east of that, is uh, the Croix de Lorraine, which stands um, tall above you know most other landmarks in this uh, <laughs> sector. And this is the site where, on um, June fourteenth, nineteen forty-four, General Charles de Gaulle came ashore on Juno Beach with uh, you know an entourage. And some people, you know, they'll ask, you know, well, why did he land at Juneau? Why not gold? Why not Omaha? Whatever. The reason was because General Montgomery's headquarters, as I said earlier, is in Crewley, which is just south of this location, basically, and is the location that the Royal Winnipeg Rifles captured at the end of the day on D-Day. And so he came ashore here to first visit General Montgomery's headquarters before he went on to Bayeux, which was the first major town liberated by Allied forces, uh, kind of on June 7th, 1944. And uh, there he could kind of make his big PR, you know, play for, you know, uh, it's a very important moment, I guess, uh, I would say for France, because, you know, again, trying to reassert their sovereignty yeah. and make sure it's not an Allied military government that takes over, all that sort of thing. So very important from a French perspective. I don't want to, you know, give that short shrift. There's a really nice plaque on this site, and I don't have a photo of it, um, but I've, but basically what it is, is it's in English and French, and it's an order of battle, effectively, of the free French naval, air, and land forces that participated on June 6th in 1944, or perhaps in Normandy more generally. So there's a list of um, free French naval ships, uh, including a battleship, which was actually a block ship used to help build the Mulberry Harbor, um, a destroyer, four frigates, four corvettes, five minesweepers, and two cruisers. In the air, the, the Free French Air Force had three fighter squadrons, one medium bomber squadron, and two heavy bomber squadrons. The heavy bomber squadrons were with the Bomber Command, and the medium bomber squadron was with um, uh, basically the Second Tactical Air Force's uh, bomber force, I believe. And then on land, they had you know, a lot of commandos and stuff like that. So the Kiefer Commando, from famous from Sword Beach. Um, there was a Free French uh, Parachute Battalion. Uh, I'm not sure how that was involved. Uh, eventually... Second Armored Division came ashore in the American sector and you know helped to get towards Paris. Um, the French SAS were also very involved um, mm -hmm. on on D Day and for Normandy, and they also had their you know military uh, administrative liaison mission. And the plaque has uh, the famous quote, if you've heard it before, from Eisenhower that basically says that the French resistance, uh, their impact was that of something like ten American divisions. So. Uh, they want to make it very clear here that the French, you know, had a significant, which is fair, role in the liberation of their own country. And even more of that would follow along with the invasion of southern France in August. Yes. So it's a really cool spot and, and you know, definitely worth, uh, worth, a, worth a visit along with all the other sites I've got here. This is Cozy's Bunker. It's interesting. You'll look online and a lot of people call this like Sergeant Cozy's Bunker. I'm not sure why or how. It became Sergeant Cozy's Bunker. Cozy was the nickname of Bill Aiken, who was the lieutenant uh, in charge of, I um, can't remember which platoon number it was right now, but the platoon that attacked this gun. Again, this is a really cool image because you can see the embrasure is behind this concrete slab that's sitting out here. The gun is, you know, the position's like tilted on its side because it got blown up. But the gun position, again, is an enfilading position. It's firing sideways down the beach, right? It's not firing directly at the beach. And the reason why that's all there like that is so, again, those shells that are hitting it, you know, directly from the front aren't going to do very much damage to the position. This is a nice image from kind of me standing right next to the bunker looking kind of in its arc of fire down the beach, I would say. And the reason I took this wasn't just for the arc of fire. You can see the Croix de Lorraine there in the background. But you can also see this really cool piece of artwork that they've put up here. 
um, with, you know, a German officer with binoculars, a German machine gun team, and then, you know, presumably members of the Royal Winnipeg Rifles B Company kind of storming, you know, up the beach. Um, and this is kind of in the dunes that exist between kind of the road and the beach proper, which is, you know, over here uh, in the background. Really neat, neat piece of artwork that I appreciated. This is the observation bunker I was talking about um, earlier that was connected by an underground uh, trench uh, covered. It wasn't underground. It was a covered trench. It wasn't underground. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that leads to the command bunker. And this bunker, along with the command bunker, are uh, locations that you can get a tour of if you go to the Juno mm -hmm. Beach Center from our Canadian guides. Uh, you can get a tour of this bunker and the command bunker as well. Which I have done. <laughs> you can see the this is like the observation, you know, tower and everything. And again, it's behind the dunes, but during the war it was not behind the dunes. No. It looks like it's in this terrible position, <laughs> yeah. but it's not. It wasn't. It's uh, it was actually in a very good position. And yeah. again, I it was I, I I think most of this was covered. Yeah, it um, was. because in that aerial photograph again with the tank, it's very hard to see this bunker. And the only reason I can recognize it is because you can see the entryway. Uh, where the entry entryway is, and, and and the rest of it's all just you know turf ground and everything. You know, the the, the vents would have been exposed. But yeah, that would have been ground level with the, yeah. the vents. Yeah. This is a Tobruk position, which housed probably an MG thirty four or an old MG 08, so you know First World War era German machine gun. Uh, this is again completely buried almost by the dunes. This is a, a position that actually David O'Keefe and his group, when they visited a number of years ago, helped to kind of unearth it along with a number of volunteers who did some really good work to do that. Uh, but basically just a machine gun position, you know, Tobruk's were fairly standard bunkers um, that they had kind of all up and down the coast. The coast. Um, and it was kind of a position to cover the flanks of that observation bunker and of the next bunker. I'm, uh, Mount yeah, <laughs> the dunes are a living thing. Oh, I yeah. swear, you know, they're, they're a living thing. It's, it's, it's amazing. It's just, yeah, it's crazy how, like, I mean, in the span of, you know, geology, it's nothing. But for us, it's how fast these things move. It's crazy. Well, and really just since, like, the 1970s has this, yeah. like, movement occurred, right? There are photos of, like, the 60s yeah. and stuff where, or at least in the couple of decades after the war where it hasn't started yet. But it really has yeah. happened. And I don't know if it affects this far down, but at um, I can never pronounce it name correctly Austrian whatever the port mm. way down they did something and it affected the beach as well right they did something mm. to the harbor mm. so I think that had an effect I don't know uh, Paul Wood is from Woody from over to TV knows more about uh, it. we talked about it one time it had some impact I don't know if it only hit for closer to it but it, it may have had an impact I'm not sure entirely. right so these are two images of the same bunker this is the bunker that's closest to the Sul River as it ent ent um, empties into the English Channel uh, this is me looking down the beach, uh, looking, the, the bigger photo is me looking down the beach towards where the Reginas would have landed. Um, and you can see the embrasure here. It's almost buried by the dunes and by the sand, uh, but it's facing out, you know, back to where I'm, you know, standing, uh, oriented down the beach to where the Winnipegs would have landed. And then this is the, the top photo is the other perspective of it, looking from the other side, um, where there's another embrasure looking down, you know, across where the harbor mouth is or the, the, the mouth of the river is and down towards where the Regina is landed. So it's a dual, a dual firing position. Yeah. There. And you can actually, if you're, if you're small enough, you can, all of these bunkers, you can pretty much go into the ones that are at the Juneau beach center. You've got to you know, get a guided tour because you know, they're locked up otherwise yeah. to kind of preserve things. But the, the other ones, if you're brave enough or if you're small enough, you can go ahead and, and try to poke your head in there. And, you shouldn't. <laughs> but uh, it's, uh, there's not much to see, to be honest. No, uh, it's just walls, but it's also it's, not the safest. Yeah, it's it's not. And But you can definitely tell that there's, there's beer bottles. And, oh, yeah. There's obviously, French people will go in there. and Teenagers. And teenagers go in and have like a beer or you know a snack or whatever. Oh, it's and, teenagers. Yeah. It's not like an 80-year-old man there, but it's teenagers <laughs> so you know standing tall above all these bunkers and very much kind of designed to to some degree emulate the bunkers a little bit um is the juno beach center and so there's the uh, uh there is the uh, observation bunker you know i'm standing kind of on the juno beach side of things taking a photograph to the south with the center in the background and to the left of the photo would be kind of the where the old trench would have been leading to the command bunker 
Um, and so if you ever you know, get a chance to go to the Juno Beach Centre, you can get a tour of these bunkers. Again, highly recommended from our Canadian guides who do a really great job. Um, and, you know, you can see some of the other accoutrements. We have some, you know, um, uh, dragons, not dragon's teeth quite, but they're, you know, uh, oh, the, uh, you know the obstacles here. Uh, yeah, the name then, escapes me at the moment. Yeah, the, the, the 25 pounder field gun, and there's also yeah. a bow force there, and then the, yeah, the, the international awesome. flags as well. Yeah. Um, you know, again, the Juno Beach Center was built and you know, fundraised for by Second World War veterans who wanted a per permanent memorial, not just to what uh, the veterans uh, who were there on D Day did, but also to, you know, all Canadian commitments and contributions to the Second World War. Uh, and they fundraised, you know, over $10 million, you know, to make that happen. And it's, yeah. you know, the museum's been open, you know, since 2003. Um, and it's been, you know, the site of, you know, pretty much all of our major tetrahedron. Yes, that's exactly. That's it. I was gonna say. Yes, <laughs> it's a I could see it. I just couldn't get it. It's a shape. It out. <laughs> and um, yes, it you know, we've we've had you know, <laughs> Canadian prime ministers hosted there. You know, French prime ministers, uh, dignitaries, etc. For you know, usually the major anniversaries every five yeah. years uh, uh, for D-Day in the Battle of Normandy. Uh, what else do I have here? Yeah, so it's it's really cool. It's it's located on the very site uh, uh, where these things happen. Um, and it's a place, to, you know, as Tim Cook has written so eloquently in his The Fight for History, it's a place to remind the world that Canada fought alongside Britain and the United States at the sharp end of the liberation of the oppressed peoples of Europe. And we're hoping that more and more Canadians will continue and uh, to come back as the COVID-19 pandemic uh, perhaps subsides and, uh, and international travel becomes more of a reality. It's a great photo, again, of the observation bunker, you know, from, from the air. Um, and you can kind of see, you know, that kind of entryway uh, for the trenches and everything that really helps you identify it in the aerial reconnaissance photographs and everything. But yeah, it's really a place for Canadians to gather and give thanks and remember uh, what our veterans did. And obviously also, uh, we don't forget the British veterans um, right. as well, uh, and, uh, who, who, among whom I believe this is one. Uh, because many British veterans, as we tried to allude to throughout this uh, show, uh, played significant roles in, uh, in in Juneau Beach and in the, the fighting in Normandy, of course, alongside the Canadians. And, you know, here's some of the, you know, photographs. This is a photograph I took um, of a guided tour by one of our guides back in April. And this is kind of them getting ready to set out on the tour here, a little bit of a briefing. And you can see these. this is a photo of the inside of the command bunker. And this is a photo of the tunnel it, the covered tunnel that it no longer goes all the way to the observation bunker, but it gives, gives you part of the way to the observation bunker. Yeah. And you can check all those things out if you, yeah. uh, if you come down. And these tours uh, have been, these tours, these bunkers have been open to the public since 2014. So, uh, you know, in two years we'll have, the, it'll be the 10th anniversary of offering these tours uh, since uh, volunteers were able to kind of clear out the sand yeah. and make them, you know, Make them awesome. safe for people to, uh, to, yeah. to discover, if you will. Yeah. And again, if there's any young people watching or if there's anybody with young people in their lives who would be interested in this sort of thing, you know, they can look at joining our guide team. We hire guides every year. Uh, the next hiring will probably take place um, kind of from September, October to November. Uh, that's usually when it takes place, uh, though things could change from year to year. Um, and we're hoping to have a, we have a really great team this year. Actually, I met them all when I was there in April. They're really keen, really uh, interested in the subject, really passionate about it and happy to be there. And uh, we're hoping to get another group of uh, enthusiastic uh, folks uh, for next summer as well. Um, yeah. And we're not as strict when it comes to, it's not quite like, you know, Vimy and stuff like that. Uh, yes, you need to be bilingual, of course, but not as strict in terms of like you have to be returning to school or anything like that. Right. Like where you may be out of school for a couple of years and still apply and will still consider your application, that sort of thing as well. So that's that's really all I had, Brad. Thanks for the opportunity. It just I'll leave it with this quote uh, from yeah. Bill Anderson, uh, 5th Anti-Tank Regiment, uh, not a D-Day veteran, um, uh, but a Battle of Normandy veteran who visited the Juno Beach Center on June 6th. And, you know, he said, I feel welcome to you. I feel as if you're visiting me. And that's that's mm -hmm. very much what we go for at the Juno Beach Center, you know, a place where people can go to really understand and learn about and reflect on uh, these lives uh, uh, that meant so much to the world 
78 years ago or more now uh, this year. So thanks for the opportunity for letting me come on. I, that wasn't entirely comprehensive, but I think it gave people a good idea of what happened on Mike Red Sector on June 6th of 1944. Yeah, it's, it was a great overview. I mean, I heard the story from like you showed us and how it comes from bits and pieces, but hearing it all together, I mean, obviously I love hearing it, otherwise I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing, but it's always great to hear it and, and how these pieces connect together. And as I try to do with my own work, the commemorative elements uh, as well are always great to uh, to have in, involved. Um, so we had one question earlier. Um, again, if you have questions about the center, future, all of that stuff that's going on now, you can ask now. Um, if you have anything, uh, we'll do our best. Uh, but we had one from earlier from, from David O'Keefe, and I did purposely bypass it to leave it for now. Is, <laughs> is, there any, uh, is there any bunkers or any defenses, I guess is what he's asking under the, <laughs> you want to, as you, it's not a bad name, actually, a controversial development area. <laughs> I don't mind that name at all. <laughs> Um, honestly, the, the answer is I don't really know. Um, I, okay, let me go back here, um, to a better image. Do, 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 do. So the development area we're talking about is like this over here. Yeah. And so there were no major defenses in that area, but there, that's not to say there couldn't have been something. Um, if I go back uh, further, the Juno Beach Center is kind of on this like big white spot here. The development would be kind of in here. Yeah, in the back. And I I expect there may not have been that much in that area, but again, I I don't know for sure. I mean, when the Juno Beach Center itself was uncut was, was built and they built the basement and dug the basement yeah. out they did find some artifacts there like they found yeah. they found a mark three helmet that was rusted to all hell and it's actually oh, on display wow. at the museum and a couple of other oh, things yeah. too yeah, yeah, yeah. so there's no real telling i guess what you could potentially find there right. i somewhat expect it might have been kind of oops, better cleared out because again they turned this area into kind of a logistical hub and so right. perhaps it got used but I mean, there's still value in that archaeology, I guess, in terms of what was going on there. And it was, you know, it was a, a boat repair shop for a good while, you know, after the war until, you know, they, they tore the place down recently and everything. So yeah. the big frustration, look, the big frustration for me is this, is they want access to the site through our road, which is basically our driveway. They want to use that for construction. That's going to impact the way we do our business at the Juno Beach Center, frankly. And they've done it in such a way that's really a, like they just haven't been considerate at all for what what we exist right. to do. And the right. way I put it to you is this: like we have, you know, the Juno Beach Center, like our official stance, and I think this is the right stance. Like we have no issue if anybody wants to go ahead and you know go swimming on Juno Beach on Mike Red Beach. There's no issue with that. That's the sort of freedom that the Canadian soldiers and British soldiers and everybody you know sacrificed to return to France during the Second World War. Right. The issue is when there's an established war memorial, which happens to be basically the most important Canadian Second World War memorial overseas, right. um, already in existence there. And the analogy I use is people are, you know, they go sun, they go swimming, they want, they want to go sunbathing, they tape their towel, and they hang it on the local war memorial to dry. Like that's kind yeah. of what's going on here in a metaphorical way. And that's what I find kind of offensive, and that's why we're fighting against it. In addition to just, it's going to be, it's going to create all manner of problems for us yeah. to manage if if those condos go ahead. So I'll leave it at that. What I can say is, we hope that there will be some sort of positive resolution yeah. on this file by the end of the summer. And there's currently mediated talks happening uh, between us, between the town and the developer which the Canadian federal government and the French government have been supportive of. And so that is what we are looking, we're looking forward to a positive outcome of that um, sequence of, of talks. Yeah, right, I'm just going to lose the slides for now uh, for the rest of the presentation. Yeah. So I don't we really have any questions, maybe some give another minute because we're in a bit of a delay, right? So um, everyone's loving the presentation. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, and again, I, 
you don't have to say anything. <laughs> and I don't think you can. But um, I know you can't say anything about anything. But uh, I, I, I talked about this, right, when I did my live stream on the 6th, just talking about D-Day and general things like that. And I mean, I'm in favor of a solution that comes with the least disruption to the JBC, as I was talking to you about that, and as people know. Uh, and I know, but I know it's not as easy as this because it never is. Because <laughs> why would it be? Things are never that that easy. Um, but I mean, I barely well that any th that anything that re that requires the developer wanting to sell. Exactly. Um, and I will say that everything that Canadians have done over the last little while in support of us has perhaps made that more likely. So we'll see. We'll see. I mean, that would be ideal. Because then they would get their cash, they can be happy with their money, go elsewhere. Well, I just, I just, I just hope the developer realizes what they've stepped into here, and says maybe, yeah. maybe this isn't worth it. We'll find, we'll, we'll find a different place to do. There's got to be some beach somewhere else that's just as good. Um, yeah. Oh, uh, hold on, we got one here. Oh, now we're getting lots of questions. We're moving too quick. <laughs> Uh, this is a fair question. I have no idea. Maybe you can give us an insight. Oh, hold on. I think I'm frozen on my end here. Oh, you seem okay to me. Um, oh, you can see me. I can't up. see myself. Yep. Well, if the, if the question's up there for you. If, uh, yes, I can see. Did we oh, there we go. <laughs> an attempt to mitigate the impacts of future development in the area before finally selecting the site? Um, is it really a surprise that someone was eventually going to build there? I suppose no, it wasn't a surprise that someone was eventually going to build there. The problem is 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 how like how they developed their project and did not involve us in any way, shape, or form, mm. even though we were going to and they didn't do their due diligence to understand that, oh, by the way, way, if you want access to that site, you have to use a road that's under property that's leased by us from the town of Corsoles for you know the next 80 something years because you know we have a 99 year total lease so there's a number of things that happen i can't talk about them too much um what was the first part of it did we consider that i guess if i was to can i share my screen very quickly um yeah i'll oh, sorry i'll bring it back up uh, yeah i have my little map up there we go right. um so this is this is the site right here of the development marked by the orange marker um this is the site that's leased to us in yellow. This is the site of our temporary occupancy agreement, and that allows us to do the bunker tours and everything. And both the lease of the site and that occupancy agreement are with the town of Corsoles. This is the only piece of land that would pose any threat to our operations or, you know, be up for grabs, if you will. Right. And so that's kind of the that's kind of the open question and i think you know sheldrake's on a little bit of a you know he's got a good idea there in terms of you know if we can secure that property yeah. and make sure it's not a problem anymore then there are no longer any further problems because all of this is protected area like you can't you can't build on any of this it's right. all it's all protected with you know it's parts of the Atlantic Wall and everything like that. Yeah, you can put up a small memorial or whatever, whatever you know. Yeah, but, nothing you intrusive. Know, yeah. The other thing is, and I'll say this and, and leave it where it is. This is a potential floodplain, <laughs> oh, yeah. and 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 with sea levels rising, I don't know if it's the best investment to buy a condo property there. That's just that's just my thinking on that. yeah that's but, fair i totally forgot but, about that but, but, but anyway um that's all i can say about that <laughs> yeah well uh, again if you can't answer it just say it but uh, why i i know why but why do they want to use the road and, and will it be the same road when if it is ever built is it the same yeah is that what they're going yeah. for or, so there's no room for a road that's the problem yeah that's the thing there is no room for any further road so there's two ways to get to their site one is this turning bridge it is a single lane turning bridge that opens mo much of the day at high tide to let the harbor traffic in and out. And again, it's only one lane. So that doesn't fulfill the, even if it was a solid bridge that was there all the time, because it's only one lane, it doesn't fulfill the requirements of having two way access to a site. Yep. Um, and then there's our road, which is a fairly small road. And it's not you know, big, this yeah. is, this is us doing, we've actually just added a bike lane to it because we're trying to encourage, you know, bicyclists to come to visit our museum um, and things like that. So it's a fairly narrow road. Um, 
the, the answer to the question is they want to use our road both for the construction. They've only got permission right now. They don't have, they can't actually build right now because of yeah. legal right. legalities. But basically, they got permission to use our road in the last decision, which is now being appealed, um, but only for the construction. So no decision has yet been made on whether or not the There's access you know, after. the access would be after that. Um, so it's it's still it's still up for up in the air, and we won't know what the decision is going forward on that until September. September is the next court date for the. Um, uh, for, for the appeal. Both sides are ironically appealing the decision because the decision actually, um, it was incorrect in the way they, the, the judge issued the opinion because they didn't, the judge did not include a parcel of land as part of the judgment that they needed to include. And therefore our position is it's not an enforceable decision because you didn't include one of the parcels of land that's relevant. Therefore we don't have to open our barrier and give people access yet because we're still waiting on a proper decision so anyway it's complicated the yeah, are, are are interesting um but we'll see like i said hopefully this will be resolved out of court and it will be hopefully. a mediated settlement can i can i ask a question that's kind of related but not exactly i mean when i'm not entirely sure um question from brian not question but a, a, the, the idea of mm. uh, another question coming about what can be done this is my question. Does Veterans Affairs offer financial support to the JPC? Yes, yes. So I think Veterans Affairs Canada has a bit of a bad rap for the original uh, fundraising component. Like the veterans okay. at the time, Veterans Affairs Canada had to be really convinced to come on side and do something. Yeah. And so they kind of came on late. Uh, but in the last 10 years or so, they've been very supportive of us, uh, certainly in the last five years in particular. Um, we have we get about a half a million dollars uh, from Veterans Affairs okay. Canada every year. Um, Could be more. <laughs> it, well, and that was established way back almost when the museum was first built, and so inflation should be more. I'll right just say now. it should be more, <laughs> and we hope it will eventually be more. And we're you know, campaigning for that, and you know perhaps out of this settlement for this, we'll come to some sort of new arrangement. I don't know, um, but that's you know. We certainly could be better supported by Veterans Affairs Canada, but I don't want to disparage the fact that they have supported us. And they've been very good, I will say, on this file. They have been very responsive to us, and they have, yeah. uh, you know, they're, they're asking us for information, and we don't actually have the information to give them yet oh, because great. these mediated things take some time, Amazing. right? So, well, that's, so great. That's, that's great to hear. It's, <laughs> yeah. I mean, the minister visited the, the museum back in April. He added us to his schedule. Yep. Um, you know, which is kind of, you know, he, he, we're, we're really glad he did that. He, he absolutely should have done that. Um, but it was important to see, you know, th that support for us. So, yeah, I'm not trying to disparage uh, Veterans Affairs either. I'm just saying it should be more A because it's, I know it's from a long time ago and just the way costs have gone for everything. <laughs> and with this new issue, um, I think it should just be higher, but I think uh, every department should be better funded. Well, uh, and I will cool. also I will also add that it's five hundred thousand dollars, and then they did bump it up for two years to basically an extra two hundred fifty thousand dollars per year because of the pandemic. Um, so that was right. very much you know, appreciated. And That's all. Hopefully, okay. going forward, we can remain at some you know, a level close to that. Yeah, they can keep it there. Um, so this is probably uh, where is it? I'm gonna find it here. Oh, I'm getting a little freezing here. Uh, Good question, and I think a good one to kind of be the wrap-up point here. What can people do to help? Well, like I said earlier, you know, Canadians have already done a really great job of advocating for us, uh, going to SaveJunoBeach.ca, uh, writing their local MP. I think they've now, the Save Juno Beach Citizens Campaign has now actually switched that maybe to a letter that goes directly to Prime Minister Trudeau, which is great. Um, they can also donate to support um, our museum, uh, either through kind of the, the link at Save Juno Beach, or through our website um, itself, because uh, we take donations through our website. Uh, right now, we're actually doing uh, the Great Canadian Giving Challenge, uh, where every right. dollar donated to us through Canada Helps uh, gets us an entry to win $20,000. So if you're in the giving mood and you'd like to support us, that's a great way to go about it right now. And if you have any questions about how you can support us, I mean, we have our brick program where you can get a commemorative brick that honors uh, a veteran perhaps who served during the second world war and we're not too picky so if you have a first world war veteran you want to honor uh, an afghanistan veteran or a cold war era veteran you know we're happy to to get those inscriptions uh, and then we also have our flag sponsorship program where you can get a flag that flew yep. on mike red 
Juneau Beach uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> for your family or for your community. Excellent tie. Excellent tie. As long as you, <laughs> as long as you, as long as you treat the flag with respect, we're happy to provide it to you for for a donation. Yeah. So that, yeah, that's great and a good tie into uh, um, everything. So yeah, everyone's singing the praises, loving the presentation. That was a great one. It just makes me a little sad that I didn't get more of the sectors in. I mean, partially my fault, partially timing, all kinds of stuff. But you know, you it. know, it's it's really funny because for me, like, I never, I honestly didn't like my kind of classic sector that I think of is like Bernier sur Mer or Saint Aubin. I, I think of yep. the I, th I think of or or even the Reginas in front of Corso. It's like I think of Juno Beach yeah. as a very interesting beach because it's a lot of a lot of the sectors on it are very um, like they're, they're it's urban com combat almost immediately, almost right? immediately, yeah. And 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 that's a bit different here. Here is a little even though it's like so right. close to Corso, it's a bit different, right? And I don't think there's too many dunes along uh, Juno Beach other than these. I think this is kind of a yeah. An exception, pretty much it. And so, honestly, before I went there, uh, just in April, I hadn't done a detailed dive on it, and I was just fascinated mm -hmm. by some of the things I found, and obviously by walking the beach. And just because it's not a built-up area, there's right. like, most of the fortifications are still there in some shape or form, right? They're just buried by the dunes, yep. <laughs> and so therefore, yeah, in yeah. some ways, preserved, right? Because people, you know, haven't built on top of them or anything like that. So. Exactly. Yeah, it's it's great. I mean that that that's the case, and but we we're talking about the dunes and how they shift, and that's just the way it goes. But it's it's it, yeah, and I mean I try to bite my tongue when not talking about you know the shuddy air or that part of the beach because of my family connection there. But um, mm -hmm. it's it, it's uh, it's a it's different, like you just said, it's different than the mind's eye. It adds, I think, to the broader story of D Day because a lot of people have. Again, I brag on this movie constantly, but Saving Private Ryan, that's what everyone envisions. Everyone thinks it's all bocage. There's just all kinds of things that people have. And we have some Americans watching and maybe some Brits later or Europeans or whomever. But I know there's Americans watching right now who hopefully we've changed some minds and, you know, some perceptions of what this stuff looks like. And I think that's important, too, because just general perceptions play a huge role in understanding well, of history. Well, and the other thing I think is important about going into this level of detail on Mike, Mike Red in particular is. Other than like Canada House at Bernier sur Mer. Yeah, the most every five years, the most Canadian eyes that get on Juneau Beach come to our museum and the dunes and the bunkers there. And so it's kind of important that people know that part of the story, right? Um, yep. Because that's yeah, what they're going to see for the most part. And it's only, you know, Juneau Beach is eight kilometers long. So there's so many stories and so many units involved. Uh, but this particular story, you know, A, it's one of the, you know, I think the Queen's own at a higher, higher crash than some of their uh, assault companies. Yes. But these were pretty brutal casualties. Oh, and, yeah. Um, you know, and it's, and again, it's, it's, it's to the credit of the guys who were there, you know, who, who, who went forward in the face of, you know, so much to take that oh, yeah. beach because, you know, regardless of all the support that was given or, or to, you know, that was attempted, you know, they had to storm that beach and, and take mm -hmm. it and they did so. And, you know, it's a, you know, June 6th is a great victory for Canada as a, as a result yep. of their efforts and the collective efforts of others. So can't forget yep. that. I think that's a good place to uh, to end it. And also, I'm sure you're getting hot in that 30 degree plus weather. I, so. I, I am. I really like to turn on my AC, if that's okay. Go ahead. I'm <laughs> going to wrap up. So go ahead. Right. I'm just going to put on me and mute you for a second anyway. So go nuts. Uh, so thanks, everyone, for watching. Thanks for coming out for another Normandy live stream. This was an excellent one. Alex, again, did an amazing job. I uh, really enjoyed this one. So... Uh, if you're new to the channel, discovering this just now, uh, please subscribe to the channel. It helps me out. The more subscribers I have, the more people see what I've done uh, now, or sorry, what I've done in the past, what will be coming up in the future. I have some plans uh, that are a bit uh, undecided at the moment. There's a few live streams left. There's one coming at the end of the week um, on Friday. There may be more details coming uh, with Rich Fisher about the MG battalions in Normandy, both British and Canadian. Looking forward to that one. I think it's Friday. If I remember correctly, I'm about to travel. So my dates are a little mixed up in my head. Uh, and then there'll be one more after that, the, the, the final show with Mike Bexold on uh, Worthington Force. So that's going to be a good one. 
Uh, yeah, so thanks again for watching. Uh, if you aren't already a patron, check out what I've got going on there. I've got lots coming up in the next couple of days because, like I said, I'm traveling specifically for doing history traveling and to provide some new comment, uh, sorry, content both for the channel, social media, but also for my patrons as well. So uh, if you'd like to see kind of that extra exclusive stuff, please become a patron. Also, it is incredibly helpful for me uh, to, to have that. Uh, the more I have, um, more patrons I have, the more likely I can do this more moving forward. Um, I talked about this before, but it's kind of a crossroads moment for me of where I'll be kind of doing next. So the more patrons I have, maybe the decisions will be a little easier if I have more patrons and a little bit more support there. So check that out if you haven't already. So thanks again, Alex. Hopefully you can cool down now. Sorry for making you turn that off. No, it's okay. It was my pleasure. My uh, <laughs> my, my, my my cold room lasted. It doesn't sound so bad now. Hour. When, of course, it came, yeah, of course. When you, before you came on air, it's like if a plane was taken off next to you. Now it sounds like a quiet whisper. Um, <laughs> anyway, people are singing the praises again. Uh, so, uh, everyone, thanks for watching. Uh, and uh, yeah, stay tuned for Friday. Oh, and I forgot to mention going to the Canadian Warplane Heritage Museum Saturday. So, if you're not subscribed to the channel, please do for then because I don't really have a plan because I don't know their schedule. So, I might just <laughs> randomly pop on with a live stream of some crazy planes going by. I don't know. So the only way to guarantee is to, to follow and uh, turn on notifications. So anyway, thanks everyone for watching and I'll see you next time on uh, Friday for sure. So everyone have a good rest of your evening. Thanks for watching everybody. Bye now.